awareness of uh, how much changes were happening. And these have been happening slowly, slowly, uh, but they've increased exponentially also during COVID. And we had occasion to spoke with Paul, with Elaine, and other time. I seems everybody share and notice there have been certain things that are transforming our also economic fabric, you know, our neighborhood. So there's so many things we don't know because of the COVID. Uh, we are uh, recovering, or maybe we are also still during the pandemic. Uh, you know, but we want to be optimistic, so we want to look probably ahead and thinking that we are in a post. Uh, pandemic, uh, uh, but definitely we are uh, losing retail diversity, and this, you know, uh, definitely makes us extremely concerned. And like, for example, uh, Greenpoint Avenue, we had a block where each single storefront is finally is being closed the loop, and there are probably seven or eight the entire block is becoming all bar and restaurant. So it's, it's again, you know, an indicator why is this happening? You know, so we have a a lot of questions and and what are we doing? Also, it was interesting to discover, you know, that we have uh, doing this work with community. You know, we discovered that the council, New York City Council, back in 2017, and I don't know if you all received it, but I believe it was forwarded by the office. I asked Marie to do that and develop uh, a report, 72 page. Uh, uh, from the committee on small business did uh, together with land use committee and at that time the chair of the committee on small business i believe was uh, cornegy uh, council member cornegy uh, council member levin was also part of the committee so all the things we we put on our agenda tonight are definitely are contained on this document of 2017 uh, where recommendations were made in in exactly the same topics um, uh, from neighborhood retail to current zoning and land use with the uh, uh, state of retail in New York City, uh, history of retail policy, and definitely, you know, uh, very interesting and very ambitious, 72 pages. And, and I don't know where we have been going after that. I believe the same issue remain, and some of that uh, issue and topic mentioned there um definitely they they become even a more severe issue today and yeah and we're here to talk and trying to understand you know uh what has happened in the meantime from 2017 uh, with the department of city planning uh with the the ambitious uh, recommendation that small business service was supposed uh, to take over and uh, uh yes and, you know and so that's what we're gonna try to to do and uh, all your input will be very appreciated and also the outreach committee why together with economic development and then i'll pass the word to toby uh, is because we want to create a platform to have this dialogue and i believe we didn't have this dialogue we stopped have this dialogue now during COVID, after COVID, there is one more reason and maybe we need policy we need parameter we need a framework uh, because this is uh, extremely important. Uh, I contact also Evergreen. I spoke with Karen Nib, but unfortunately, there were other uh, conflict tonight. But you know, I believe they they have the same concern. Um, you know, entertainment in the industry, industry has been prevailing even deeply into the the industrial fabric, especially in the light manufacturing zone, in the M11 zoning. And um, yeah. I pass to you, Toby. Uh, if you want to continue, please. Yeah, yeah. And I just, I just wanted to add. Hold on. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to add. First of all, to commend Sante, who I got to know first in person and then virtually over the last two years, who's really been a tremendous addition to the community board. Uh, puts in a, a lot of time. Proactively approached me. Uh, I, I volunteered for the ad hoc committee just because I saw how passionate he was about the neighborhood, and I really think that there's a real need for this grassroots voice and really thank you, Elaine and Paul and everybody else who's participating with short notice. So the only thing I wanted to add is that you know, I'm a holder of a liquor license. I've spent a lot of time trying to help people maneuver that process. And this is not about being anti bar and restaurant. Um, this is about really figuring out how to even the playing field because for the neighborhood to succeed, we need all kinds of retail. You know, the, the word Sante uses is, your retail diversity. I have a beautiful map we give out 
um, at the when you come to the Williamsburg Hotel, which unfortunately we had to make a new one because a lot of those stores no longer exist. Um, and it's people come to the community, whether it's a resident, we just had hosted a beautiful market, or it's people visiting, and they don't just want to see bars and restaurants. So I think, you know, in, in, in this little forum, there's really dialogue to be had. I think this is a very influential neighborhood, vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the city. Um, but to think about the dynamic at play, and the, the one thing that comes to mind, and I'll hand the floor back to Sante, you know, I always tell the story of, what would have happened if Bloomberg had not protected the industrial zones and how it's played out in Williamsburg, of course, is, you know, all kinds of companies moving in, you know, we're all working very hard to create accessible jobs, but, you know, we're, we're at risk now with the outdoor excess space and other elements of really making it impossible for a, a venue or really a retail location that's not in the liquor business to succeed and compete with their, with their neighbors. And, the ultimate output and, and the result of this is something unfortunate for everyone, whether you be a resident, a business owner, um, you know, a member of the community, or even a visitor. And I think it's a, we can't solve all the problems. Some of these have to do with state level policy. Some have to do with city level policy, but I think that we need to at least start the conversation and figure out, you know, what we can do um, at the grassroots in the community. And thank you again to everyone who's participated. And we look forward to working closely with the North Brooklyn Chamber to help, you know, have the voice of the community heard. So I'll hand the floor back to Sante. Uh, yeah, so now we'll pass to, um, to others. So definitely to add to what you were saying, you know, other things that me and Toby, we have discussed really. And, and I felt that I was myself part of uh, uh, maybe one of the hipsters when I came here 25 years ago. Actually, I came here in the 80s the first time, but because I had friends, I was very young. Then I moved back to Italy, then I came back. But, uh, you know, and I had a manufacturing space where, you know, I, uh, from my architectural study, I enter into designing and I self-produce. So I manufacture and I work in the art and design world. And until a um, few months ago, I had a 4,000 square feet of uh, industrial N11 zoning on uh, Metropolitan Avenue. So I thought that I was uh, uh, one of the individual that add to the narrative or the Brooklyn brand, you know, even if I many did anonymously, you know, by engaging and people, I remember many years ago, they were coming to Williamsburg to my studio to look at my uh, furniture and my design piece. And, uh, and now I still do that, but I likely, but if I didn't have that opportunity, even the affordability of an industrial space, it was still affordable. I mean, I, we had to pay for, but uh, if you were creative, there were way to go around. Now, you know, many will be deprived of that opportunity for other uh, reason how the real estate has developed and, and it's not my field to talk about that. Uh, but definitely, we contribute, people like me contribute to the creation of the Brooklyn brand. And being European myself, originally, I'm a naturalized American. I had always many people, professional, creative people that they, they did, and now during COVID, unfortunately, they kept coming, but the one that came, they felt that there were, something was missing. People, even if we say that there is an industry that, and we need to focus on tourism, and this is a global phenomenon, or at least in the Western world, is happening the same in Italy. Uh, we really had to think very hard because people came to New York certainly to shop, you know, and the, the the connection between entertainment, but it can't be just entertainment. People came to Williamsburg, there were so many creative business. And I work in retail design with architectural firm in the past in one of the many things that I did as, a, as an American pioneer. I, I say sometime here, maybe too many jobs. Uh, uh, but today, and I'm in contact with others, I still do retail design. This is another very big issue, important issue that still people will need to experience uh, 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 physically retail. You can order a pair of socks you already purchased two million times for running, you could do it on Amazon, but the narrative in New York, if we're taking away the narrative of people making things and having this curated, even if you don't make, but the fact that some creative people, some creative brain could curate something and propose it, bring it to a plate, with, with a vision of being New Yorker, being open to the world, 
this is our recipe for success. We have to look back at our past if we want to succeed in the future. And because that's always an important reference, it is in architecture, it is in urbanistic. But definitely the lack of an holistic, and myself, I question, what's the master plan? And maybe we should all question together, what is the master plan? Because we need to think of this holistically. And, 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 and we, it's too easy to say, oh, now everything is online. And whatever data was built in 2017, today has changed. So we're gonna need to call in professional and the academic too, to really understand what is the data today. But we can just let it go and say, because uh, it's unfair to say, oh, we are anti-business, what kind of business? Maybe people envision different businesses, you know, but- Dante, why don't we uh, take, I, was, I thought we should maybe um, ask uh, either Paul or Elaine- Yes, On behalf absolutely. of the North Chamber. To really, we'd love to get any thoughts you have and the feedback you're hearing from the businesses and the community as to, you know, what's the state of play right now post COVID with their businesses. We'd love to hear from either but one or both of you. Um, <clears throat> okay, I'll, I'll go first. Um, Paul and I have been having some meetings with some local people and uh, Francoise is on, she was on here. Um, She's there. I first. see her. <laughs> Okay, um, one of them was Francoise, and um, I'm not sure, I think it was Greenpoint Avenue, and there were five liquor licenses given in one block. Um, this is exactly what you, you're talking about, that we don't want this to happen. We've got to have the diversity back of the small, you know, cute little shops that make Williamsburg and Greenpoint Bushwick, you know, what what, what people want to see when they come into a neighborhood, they don't want to go by five bars in a, in a row. So, um, you know, if we're not careful, we're going to start to look like, uh, you know, Miami Beach here with, with, with everything. So, um, I don't know, Paul, do you want to add something to that? Well, you know, I, I don't need to tell anybody uh, that, you know, it's still depressing to see the amount of uh, empty storefronts that exist that uh, we had hoped we might start seeing occupied and they haven't been yet and they're still sitting there and they're just getting uglier uh, by the day because they're being used, uh, you know, as a uh, sleep headquarters or graffiti headquarters or whatever so you know the neighborhood visually is really taking a hit and continuing to take a hit it doesn't have that it, it doesn't have that luster that uh, you know even though it was kind of you know uh a little bit of a off the beaten path radical luster still had a sense to it that you know you appreciated visually when you came into our neighborhood and now you can't help but feel uh, a, a bit depressed in what you see I mean, with regard to what Elaine was saying, yeah, it's very true. Um, you know, it, it, I guess it's uh, surprising, but it's become much easier just to set up a, a bar or a restaurant or something and, you know, uh, food and beverage uh, than it is to um, to do a, a boutique or any sort of shop right now, which, which is interesting because we all know that it's still not easy to do that because the SLA is just still kind of all over the place with what they're doing as far as timing goes. We still get a lot of people that come to us and uh, tell us that they're just sitting and waiting for what's going on. So I guess that's a good thing because if they weren't delaying people, it probably would be 10 on one block as opposed to five. Um, uh, you know, the other thing that, Santi, that you mentioned, which <clears throat> is a reality, is that um, the only thing that we do see, continue to see an influx on is, uh, brown cardboard boxes that get delivered by you know amazon and uh, everybody you know no matter how often you try and preach about loving local and and shopping local and supporting your neighborhood and that it's um it's falling on deaf ears quite a bit simply because the other component is so easy to do and i guess everybody got so used to it you know during the last 18 19 months that now we're faced with trying to break a new habit uh, that uh, just makes it easy for people not to do what we're asking them to do. Um, the one positive thing, though, is that we have, uh, as a chamber, we put on a, a, uh, a new membership individual that's been working with us for a couple of months now. 
And she's very uh, active within the community. By that, I mean hitting the streets and talking to people. And she surprisingly comes back to us every week and says, I've got three new businesses that are interested in joining. I got four new businesses that are interested in joining. So there's a lot of, uh, maybe not a lot, but there is rebirth and it's happening. I guess you have to go looking for it. You have to reach out to it and you have to, you know, not expect it to just happen overnight. But, you know, we do feel somewhat uplifted, let's say, by, you know, the reports that she gives back to us. That And these are not, um, you know, she's not talking about, you know, food and beverage places. She's not talking, she's talking about little shops, little boutiques or whatever they are. And uh, so, you know, that's a positive thing. So, you know, but whatever it is, it's, um, I, th I think, you know, as far as we are concerned, uh, our position as a chamber is, it's going to take a long time. It's not happening anytime soon. The ramping up is not is not quick, and it's it's not direct. It's dragging, and and it's um, it's uh, upsetting, is what it is. So, that's yeah, that. I, yeah, I wanted to ask you a question, Paul, because you know you mentioned about the people coming and asking for help, and then Elaine talked about the five. Yeah. Do you have feedback or even just gut or insight as to why the, the the stores opening sooner are food and beverage establishments versus more traditional businesses? Because you would think, and I, I just see this firsthand, and I even myself as a landlord, when there's empty spaces, the landlords are just desperate to get a tenant in. We signed a short-term lease for a year on Grand Street. We never would have contemplated a user like that for a right. year just, just to fill the space. So. It should be, and you see in Soho, I mean, I've walked around, there's a lot of young boutiques coming in, people that couldn't necessarily have afforded that rent that are signing shorter term leases. Mm -hmm. And we should talk offline about maybe an initiative we could do to engage with landlords around that. But why do you think food and beverage more than anything else in this well, moment? You know, it's, it's funny, it's surprising because as I kind of mentioned, it, it, it's it's much more difficult you know, all right, yeah, if you're walking into some place that's already built out and you're basically just going to take it over and hang some new posters and, you know, paint a wall or whatever and then sign up for a liquor license, then it's it's a relatively easy to do. But it, normally it's a, it's a grind in order to be able to do that, especially if you're building out a kitchen or building out a bar or something like that. So we're surprised actually that it's it's happening that rapidly. And I don't, I don't know if it has to do with the fact, I mean, a, a lot of people that we speak to uh, refer to the perception, the perception of North Brooklyn now. And the perception of North Brooklyn now is led by F and B. It's like, it's where I go to eat, it's where I go to drink. And we don't hear enough people saying it's where I go to shop. And it used to be, it used to be where you'd go to shop, where you'd go to look in galleries, where you'd, you know, you would do things like that. And somehow that has uh, fallen by the wayside. Now, Obviously, the pandemic had a lot to do with street traffic and things like that, people walking around and happening into shops. But the the perception, or let's call it the brand of North Brooklyn, doesn't seem to include small business any longer. It doesn't seem to include little boutiques. It doesn't seem to be the place where people would go and you know, like, like some of you have, you know, take a shot and let me take a storefront and let me see what I can make of it. Um, the, the few that we know that uh, continue uh, took a shot at it, but now they're making the majority of their business profit online, which allows them to continue to keep their brick and mortar open. But just as a freestanding brick and mortar, I, you know, and, and I don't quite honestly, I don't think either Elaine or I really know uh, we know that the landlords are desperate and we know that a lot of them are cutting deals or whatever, but I have no idea exactly what they're asking. And I have no idea if some, you know, some individual who makes jewelry in their bedroom now wants to open a shop, if it's actually going to be within reach of them or not. Um, don't know. Uh, the only thing I do know is that, um, I, as I walk the streets, I can't help but see crowds still pouring out of every bar and every, you know, uh, restaurants are crowded, lines inside and outside and lines outside of bars. Uh, so there are people around, but that seems to be where their attention is right now. And maybe it's this, you know, this uh, period of celebration or whatever, and then eventually it'll wind down. But, uh, you know, 
I don't know. I really don't know why um, all these people have come out of the woodwork and decided they're going to open bars and restaurants, and and they are. You know, you know one one of the other things that always confused me too, and I, you know, this probably isn't the time or the topic that we should be discussing, but I'll throw it out there anyhow. Um, you know, we have a lot of friends in Babar or claim to be from Babar or say they're from Babar. But then, you know, when we bring up Babar to somebody who supposedly is in Babar, they say, oh, well, Babar is basically Belize and Dave. And that's, you know, so, I mean, if if there was a, an actual organization that was Babar and we could interact with them and we can, you know, get in touch with them and exchange information and, and find out a little bit about how they're thinking and what's going on. You know, I understand it's basically nothing more than a every now and then Google group right now. And, you know, you would think that some, um, a group that has that kind of presence in North Brooklyn would be a little more of a true presence of more of an organization because we'd love to work with them. We have great relationship with the couple of people that call themselves Babar, but I can tell you at any day of the week, I have no idea how many people, how many different organizations or institutions are included in Babar as members. It could only be one or two, could be 150. I have no idea. So we'd like to be more in touch with them if there was truly a Babar. That's it. So I, I will tell you just as an aside that I, I met a gentleman last week who says he's taken over for Felice. So I'll connect you and as to whether the that organization is still open. But I had a question and maybe thought it was curious to get your input on. So, you know, one example I point out, I know if everybody's familiar with the bathhouse, which opened on the corner of North 10th and Berry. Yeah. Which obviously they started building out pre COVID, but. Basically, what they've done is, I don't know what their plan was originally, and this was their plan from the beginning. It's a beautiful space. It's a, it's a phenomenal bathhouse. And now they have a restaurant, so to speak, on the ground floor that's helping sustain their business. But mm -hmm. think about this. If they were only a bathhouse and not a restaurant, they wouldn't be able to take advantage of the use of the sidewalk and the street. So what that means as a tenant, so to speak, is that I don't know if it's 20% or 25%, but there's some very significant premium that they're getting, which has the effective impact of lowering their rent per square foot. That if they were only a bathhouse, if there would have been like, let's do this theoretical exercise. So mm -hmm. bathhouse number one and Russian Banya number two, and they're both competing. And one of them wasn't going to be a restaurant. They would have less space paying yeah. the same rent. So. If you extrapolate from there again, you know, as an owner of a restaurant and not someone that's against free enterprise, but it's we've created this dynamic where there's an unfair advantage today for anyone operating a food establishment that has now free use of the street, the sidewalk sure. that makes the challenge even greater because, you know, you talk to what a landlord's charging, but of course, in the post COVID world, everything's negotiable. But if you're negotiating, if you're a clothing store or a bookstore or whatever uh, an entrepreneur wants to sell and you're negotiating against someone that knows they could put up a structure and expand with another, you know, seating for another 30 people outside, it makes it like an impossible situation. I mean, it's like a Gordian knot that you can't unwind. Yeah, no, that's so very I true. I mean, when it was feedback on this, yeah. Yeah, it was very true. I mean, you know, we reacted to it when, uh, you know, over the past 19 months when they first decided to do that. And, and there were all these different advantages that were given to bars and restaurants. And then, okay, yeah, one time they said, oh, no, now stores can actually move their goods out onto the sidewalk as well and sell. And, you know, it, it's like, come on, give me a break. I mean, who can actually move enough of their, you know, their, their, goods out onto the store as opposed to setting up a six foot table and putting a few pairs of socks and a couple pieces of jewelry that you have to take in and out every day. But for some reason, the city felt that, well, we're balancing it out a little bit now, but that did absolutely nothing. It was, it was, it was silly. It was ridiculous. I can go out and I can build a structure outside and I can, you know, put in a few chairs and a few tables. And like you said, it expands my, 
you know, my, my, my restaurant or my bar by 20, 25, 27, 28, 30%, but I can't, I can't move stock out of my store. First of all, they won't let me do it because I'm not a bar and restaurant. So, you know, it's, it's, it's totally unbalanced. It's ridiculous. I mean, I know, you know, this is one of the things when Elaine and I were talking months ago with Francoise also about, you know, a little boutique trying to take advantage of that great opportunity that the city gave them by saying you can put a card table out on the sidewalk and sell your goods. It was a joke. You know, it was also, just a joke. Also, uh, to tap into what Paul and Toby were saying, I mean, I can give media our portion of community in Greenpoint, but definitely I've been connected to other group in the West Village, in the Lower East Side, you know, where, you know, they already have seen changes even before COVID. And so just to say to what you were saying, but um, going back, uh, because there's another factor, I believe, from our analysis, from our experience, right? At the heat of the pandemic, when uh, the clothing store actually created boutique here on Franklin and Milton uh, Street, uh, the manufacturer pieces. Really, that two, three months were uh, very hard and they left. And the landlord maybe wasn't very tolerant either. And definitely he knew there was going to be somebody that could pay ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. So it's interesting why there was definitely a, a true claim for many uh, entertainment business in the city, of which were hit very hard, and they require help. And so many of our neighbors here, that you know, of which we love, you know, that they have business and they needed support. But many they said they did well between the community, between the order online, between the structure outside. But what is surprising, Paul, that at that time there was an exponential growth of liquor license. The community board one had problems, still has problem. You know, they, you can even interview the people. So what before 30, now 65 license in a month for what tell that us the, the expansion of a footprint of a 200 square feet, 300 square feet store that before it would only be a boutique. And so if you were one of the landlord, that's it. That's what you can get. You can get $10,000 a month now. And it, that's the absurdity because there weren't parameters and policy. We say, hold on a second. We have a, a bar and restaurant. They were here before. They are in difficulty. They don't need additional competition. We have allowed to come others to take a space and other dynamic because uh, this we know very well. When you, uh, you see, you can open as a pop-up for six months, for one year, for two years. But when you are a bar and restaurant, and this is the model in all the city and Toby knows very well. You need 10, 15 years leases. That's what you do. So the moment we lose a 300 square feet storefront, a 500 square feet storefront, and this in Greenpoint by the story district, this in Williamsburg around where you are too, the majority, because the big spaces we know, maybe you only a big bar, a big restaurant can take it or a supermarket, you know, but the smaller storefront are the one they are uh, and most dangerous, that the one we give opportunity. And I believe uh, it's not just, an, it's gonna, we didn't give a, give a chance to stay empty because the landlord immediately occupied, and I have neighbors that I know, they are landlord, <laughs> they own the storefront. And yes, during the pandemic, they gave it like three months uh, to do some work, maybe four months, they made a deal. But then after that, they're gonna pay, they were getting double the money they were getting before. So, you know, this is something a city, uh, New York City Council had envisioned before to find a way, how do we put policy? And I do have understanding also, Paul, that I believe uh, something I'm very passionate. This is a city planning issue. We have to envision how we want a land use decision. They transform economically. They can transform the social fabric. And we is that 10 minutes walk neighbor that we were talking, 10 minutes walk neighbor where you could have everything, where individuals still could have a sort of American dream and other big issue into the economic People, they have no higher level of education. They cannot work from home remotely. They cannot make $100,000 or even $50,000 a year. These were the people that if they could pay $3,000, $5,000 a month, they could start a business and be independent. And this is still a reality in urban environment. Mm -hmm. You know, we just not giving that possibility, but this is my opinion, but definitely I love other to say more because yes, it's true, but we, and then when, once 
they take a space. Once a space goes to the entertainment industry, it's gone forever. First, because these are 10, 15 years. And then there is a tradition where the space is taken and it's grandfather. So even if you have a new legal license, it's going to give you a grandfather. That's give justification also to New York State Legal Authority, which, are, you know, they also have a responsibility. But maybe we didn't communicate with the state either because we had a 500 foot rule that somehow was indirectly establishing parameter, right? Where we could automatically say, hold on, now there are five licenses, that's too many. But we had on, frankly, one block, 15 licenses. 15, it means, uh, and so are we communicating to the states together with the city, with our public representative? I mean, uh, really what, a, what a, this is a desire for a framework. I'm glad Lincoln Wrestler is also here so he can hear, you know. Hi, uh, Ms. Asante, this is Boston. Concern from the community. in this neighborhood all of my life. And I've seen the changes from industrial and to where it is today. And I understand what you're saying. I sit on the SLA committee. It's difficult for us to make these decisions, whether people get licenses or not. Because if we say no, they go to wherever the state liquor authority and they get a yes. So I'm just gonna say, please don't throw us under the bus. Also, I keep hearing North Brooklyn, um, old resident. North Brooklyn, Williamsburg, please. This is what I mean by change. We are missing a lot of retail stores. And I feel it because I grew up in the era of good old John's bargain store. Woolworths. All these little stores you can go and get clothing, things for your house. Um, last minute shopping for a birthday present. Even SM, we used to have SM, which is now changed. How, I don't know if anyone came to Williamsburg on this end to do a survey to see what the people need and want. I hear North Williamsburg, I call this Williamsburg, North, South, East, and West, Williamsburg, the whole Williamsburg. <clears throat> so we're talking about liquor licenses and all the bars. I'm sick of them too. I'm, I don't drink, period. <laughs> I believe Julia. I'm let's, glad you... let's see. Well, hold on, let her finish. Let Julia finish. Let's, yeah. let's try to collaborate about how we can make this a change. I mean, I keep hearing, uh, we don't, basically, what I'm hearing is we don't want this. We don't want this. How can we change this? Like people say, how do we change the narrative? How do we get our neighborhood back to being what it was when we did have shops? When we did have stores, I mean, like you said, every block has at least five bars on it. And with this pandemic, which we are still in, I too shop on Amazon because I don't want to be in the crowds of the stores. And I miss the stores. I miss all those little stores that I could just run to. Oh my goodness, I've run out of dish liquor and I have to run up here. Oh my God, I need a pot holder. I need to go here. I don't have that. I, the 99 cent store might have it, but there's no guarantee. But how, as a committee, and we're pulling in another committee, how do we reach out to the community of Williamsburg to see what the people want? And has that been done through the entire Williamsburg? Not just North Brooklyn, which is North Brooklyn, Williamsburg. That's my question. And let's see how do we work to do that. Oh, I, 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 believe, I, want to start there. I want to just respond. First oh, of all, Julia. Let, I, me just, let me just tell Julia that maybe about eight years ago, I, I'm not sure about the time frame, but city planning did come down and go through the through the um, commercial district storefront by storefront. I wish Karen was here because she could probably fill that in when they would, did the change of what was going on with the retail. Now, that was a study that was done. I, I don't know if I still have it or, but city planning did do a comprehensive study because they were concerned about Grant Street, what kind of businesses were going in there. And the other thing I just want to say, 
is the state is going to look for things that are going to be revenue producing. And selling a t-shirt or a pair of pants is not going to produce the money that you get from food and liquor. So, I mean, that's everything's in their hands. We can only make recommendations. That's what we do with the committee is to try to get them to sign stipulation. Make sure we give that to the state. We try to work with it that way. Otherwise, we have no say. And we do not grant licenses. We make recommendations to them uh, about them to the state. And that's, that's all I have to say. <laughs> well, uh, no, and I want to add to that. Thank you, Marie. Julia, this is not at all, you know, we understand how challenging it is to be on the liquor committee as residents in the community who are uh, under this pressure and this constant assault without much only having recommendation power. So I think the goal of this of this open forum now where economic development where I've unfortunately almost never had a quorum uh, and Sante who maybe is better at recruiting than I am because he gets people to come is really to try to open this dialogue and think how people like yourself who are on multiple committees is there something more to do to come up with a better approach to putting forth the view of the community well, we won't say north or south or east or west the view of the community with regard to this major major problem and I just echo what, what Sante said I mean I think the biggest issue is once a location goes the route of a nightlife venue, it's it's virtually impossible to get it back. And it's a complicated issue. And there's no, no committees at full, certainly, because we're all just, none of us have any power, really, other than our voice. But you, you make some very, very valid points. You know, you know, I grew up also, we had a, like, all, like a convenience store that had everything. You could buy your notebook for school and your erasers and a pot. And then at one point, it, there was a fire, and then the owners decided not to, to, to reopen and now at the restaurant. So it's, it's, you know, I think we all remember a moment when there was a local, uh, it was a family owned store and we literally house gifts, like you said, you know, big birthday presents and school supplies. That's where it took my kids for years to get school supplies. So I think it's a complicated issue and we need to start at least by isolating what it is and trying to work together to come up with a plan and what we think makes sense. And that's all I wanted to add, but thank you, Julia. Yeah, because this has never happened before this scale, you know, little by little has happened, but now it's so tangible and, and definitely, you know, we need to find a way and it's even unfair because I, at first I've been attending the SLA review committee, uh, you know, working with this portion of the community and, and we've been sending it out to the Greenpoint coalition and the Greenpoint coalition has taken a job, which you shouldn't even take on to sign support agreement where to put in place at least parameters. I mean, it's unfair. It's unfair to the community. It's unfair to the community board, to the SLA review committee, to go through like all these license and be in that position where you have to say supported or not supported and the state, despite the, the recommendation of the community board, even when there were no, and there were like 15 license within like a block, uh, they were granting a license, but again, it shouldn't be a battle against the license. It should be a battle, and that's maybe what we like to transform, to really have a framework where maybe multiple committee can work together, the economic development, the outreach, have a meter in the community, and understand it, you know, uh, how organically, how holistically we evaluate our block, because uh, it's true, you know, this community here that is present, is active, is advocating for things, we can have a meter how, you know, things are changing, you know, even the select review committee doesn't know, people don't live in all the community, but we are here, and many members are here tonight, because we are involved uh, uh, deeply into this dynamic, you know, and definitely, we need, you know, uh, uh, our representative, you know, uh, our council representative, our assembly rep state representative. Sunday, do you want me to say hello? And, and yeah, 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 yeah okay. please. Sorry. I was going to pass it to you. Okay. Just, Prince Walsh has had her so Prince Walsh has had her hand raised for a while. Okay, FYI. I can leave. It's fine. I, you guys can go on. It's okay. Go ahead, Lincoln. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, Lincoln. Just... Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I really want to just thank you all for having me and for organizing this. And I think that the lack of retail diversity that we are increasingly experiencing across Williamsburg and Greenpoint is a critical challenge and one that we really need to collectively prioritize together. I think that um, the, the crux of the challenge um, of seeing 
you know, an increased concentration of in the hospitality industry and not enough other uses. I think it's being keenly felt by neighbors. And I, I definitely agree that a greater retail mix, more uh, small businesses and boutiques, supporting local entrepreneurs, especially women and people of color is critically important. And I also think that an increased focus on the arts would be really welcomed and appreciated. I found in other neighborhoods when we conduct surveys and really get input from residents on the types of businesses that they'd like to see in the neighborhood, it is incredibly helpful from a recruitment standpoint. It makes it easier for us to approach entrepreneurs and small businesses that might exist in nearby areas to open a second shop in our community because um, they, they can see that the community wants it. I also think that, you know, in addition to the great work of the North Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, we should think about additional, you know, supporting their efforts to organize businesses and think about additional opportunities there. Um, I, I really do um, support uh, business improvement districts. And if there's an appetite among property owners and small businesses in the North side and in Greenpoint in particular, I think there's a real opportunity there for us to do more um, and, and potentially create a strong vehicle and a strong voice for um, bringing in the types of businesses that we need and ensuring local hiring. You know, we've got eight NYCHA developments across community board one. We have not done nearly a good enough job um, in ensuring that our local uh, community, especially low income residents are benefiting from the economic opportunity that exists in our neighborhood. And so I really hope that we can work together community board one and local elected officials to work with small businesses to work with new uh, economic development entities to hire locally. And, you know, when projects go through the Euler process from the community board to the council, I want to help make sure that we're being deliberate about bringing in the right types of mixed uses, the right types of businesses and that they're hiring locally. Uh, I also think that we need to look at what, how we can incentivize our property owners, uh, our landlords to bring in the right types of small businesses that are really meeting the needs in the neighborhood and interested in exploring ideas with you all and how we can do that. I know that uh, it can be frustrating from the community board perspective to see liquor license application after liquor license application. It's challenging for neighbors. We need to be uh, carefully reviewing these applications and working together along with our state elected officials to push back where it's appropriate. And, um, you know, it's not anti-bar or anti-restaurant. Uh, it's just to say that we've got to be deliberate in our planning. And I think that's the spirit of this meeting uh, that it, uh, if we don't plan, um, then uh, things just happen around us. And so I really appreciate uh, Sante and Toby, your efforts to bring us together and everybody from CB1 and, and the community members that are here um, and look forward to being a partner with you all to try to be helpful in in, um, in deepening the retail diversity uh, and, and uh, mix of uh, community and economic development initiatives that are happening around our neighborhoods. And, you know, I'm excited to get to work with you all. So thank you so much. Really and appreciate thank you for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate that. We're going to be in touch. Absolutely. Thank you, Lincoln. Thank Have you, a great John. day, guys. Thank Take you. Care. This Bye. was very important to us that you were here tonight. Thank you for thank inviting you. me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for it. your word. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. So I think Francois was waiting to Francois, speak. Yes. Francois, go ahead. We're here with you. So I, I just kind of want to circle back because I live on the block that has, you know, has I think over five liquor licenses now. Um, you know, but I think we have to kind of have continue to have kind of cross uh, functional conversations because the other thing that's kind of concerning is DUIs are up 72% to last year. So we're building a bar business. People are also coming to the bar business and that is also causing us to not have safe streets, um, which is, you know, concerning because we, you know, there've been deaths um, in our neighborhood. But um, so just a bit about my background, um, I have 20 years of retail experience um, from brands as large as like J. Crew, Club Monaco, but my part of the job has always been to work on collaborations and work with small businesses and small brands. So I've worked with over 5,000 small businesses across the United States. I think one of, um, you know, my biz biggest concerns in terms of, of retail diversity is frankly that, um, you know, part of when we started the North Brooklyn Small Business Owners was that our elected officials weren't really reaching out um, to the small businesses. And, you know, Elaine and Paul kind of would joke that we were the boots on the ground and would report back into them. And it was a great, I mean, it's been a great collaboration, but I, I really think that city planning needs to go back out there and, you know, not just in our neighborhood, but I think this is citywide because it's on the Upper East Side, it's Soho, it's the East Village. 
and really look about look where those vacancies are. And you know, Toby, you you touched on this earlier, but then also to talk with the landlords um, because nobody wants you know their their space to to remain empty. But it, this is all over our city, and I know that we can kind of only focus on Greenpoint, Williamsburg, and Bushwick. But you know, we can be an example for the rest of the city, not just you know build back better, but what does that mean? Not just retail diversity, but how do we also build back um, ethically and sustainably? I think Ovenly, which is uh, you know the bakery on our block, one of the things that you know I think they've been here for over a decade. Their hiring practice is they hire formerly incarcerated um, individuals, and you know they are such a gem in the community, and they're so loved. But that's also one of the reasons why, because not only do they give back to the community, you know, but they're really taking on um, a different hiring practice. You know, so it's there's so many different layers to this cake in terms of. of how to bring our community back to life. You know, it's not just nightlife. It's also, um, you know, there's a store called Camp, which is kind of like an indie uh, kids store for toys. And their first shop was at the Flatiron District. And it actually was an old restaurant space. So it was huge. And so up front are the toys. And then in the back, they had basically like an indoor playground, but they would change it quarterly. And as they've grown, they opened one in Hudson Yards. And what they brilliantly did, and I, we went this weekend, our family, is they've taken over the entire fifth floor of Hudson Yards, and they have basically turned it into, you know, it's, it's very clearly abandoned and empty retail stores. Um, but it's a play space for kids, you know, and you pay $35 per ticket. But they've really reimagined what retail can look like, but not only what retail can look like, but how to create those spaces for the community. Um, so it's time, I really think it's just time for total and complete out of the box thinking, um, you know, to welcome independent brands and businesses back into New York City. And I see that, that, I see that Dell is on. And Dell, I feel like I sort of missed the boat. I know that there was a, some sort of a zoning, uh, I don't know if it was a permanent change in terms of the ability to have the restaurant structures. Do you do you know, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, and if you don't have the information, I, I was just curious if maybe San, Asante, you know, what what is the state of play in terms of the exterior re uh, restaurant structures? Is it something that has to be well, renewed annually? Is it now a permanent situation for us? Well, 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 there is to say, and then also Ben Solitaire is here from council member. I know um, Levin, I know we'll have to go somewhere else hey. soon. But I gonna maybe we can have Ben say something on that and say more as it has been uh, with Steve uh, Levin, even when that the retail diversity document. Uh, yeah, so Ben, I just prepared. asked about the, the structure. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, what yeah. the story is right now. I heard that. Yeah. Um, the uh, the vote, which was the vote on making there was there, there was a resolution to make it a permanent process under the domain of the DOT. Uh, you've heard the present the presentation was that CB one a while ago, but uh, that vote had it was supposed to be next week, and it was pushed back to the next <coughs> administration. So there's no date right now. It just won't be voted on next week. So. Um, so guess. obviously most of us on this call think it's a good thing just because we feel that there has to be more inputs from the community about right. something that's so probably the biggest impact on retail diversity is the ability to expand in those in those structures. He's saying basically for now it's shelved and that it'll get picked up in, under the new administration and the new council. Yes, you can look under our zoning application portal, zap dot com or nyc zap dot com but look up nyc zoning application portal and you can track you can find the text and the next actions it's sort of it just says it's been to the community boards i think is the last action but you can keep track of it then or check into a lincoln's <laughs> office um so yeah that's sort of uh where that is um is there do you, should i uh, offer some thoughts sante or do you want to no that please i want you to uh, yeah, say yeah. more so hold on that, I'll, I'll start by saying that's we're, that we're, i'm very relieved to hear that because when sante called me i thought like i missed the boat and i was asleep 
And no, so I thought so this is so very too. good news. We're very, was, I know, I know the presentation was, but we didn't know, understand what the recourse was to even weigh in. So this is very good news for us in terms of yeah, our. Yeah, I, I thought it was uh, going to happen uh, next week, and then I somebody else asked me the question, and I looked into it. So, um, yeah, yeah, I, I've seen obviously the increase in the uh, nightlife of of Greenpoint, and you know Williamsburg is sort of a, a sailed ship in that respect um over the years there's nobody nobody would disagree that retail diversity is important you know that's why malls have many different stores you know they don't have they don't have one store and everybody wants to live somewhere where they can go get those school supplies or uh clothes or get a drink or dinner or whatever or clothes and all that kind of stuff um i do i mean we work or live live and work in a free market environment, a capitalist free market environment. So the reason those are all happening is, uh, in the neighborhood is because they're all making money. I assume most of them or some of them might be, you know, whether or not they are, they are, if they open, they are thinking they're going to make money and either they do or they close and another bar opens. I think a lot of what Lincoln said and what Francois said is great. I think, you know, we need to encourage local hiring we need to co encourage hiring of hard to hire populations like the formerly incarcerated but we also have to sort of start lower like with in schools and high schools or or uh, in college about opening businesses and looking at how to how to plan a neighborhood i mean city planning you know we all said during the campaign we need comprehensive planning um that doesn't say that this block's going to have you know two liquor stores and a restaurant and a clothing store, it just says that we're gonna have some controls over how that happens. And that's a long-term process. Um, but, you know, we have to, I think bids, I do think are great North Brooklyn Chamber. Uh, hello, Paul and Elaine. I haven't been by for a while, I apologize. <laughs> I will come by soon. But, you know, they do great stuff to promote their uh, neighborhoods. So I think that kind of uh, structure, the small business group that, that Francois helped with, uh, very important. But you need to get out there and promote it to the community. You can't promote it. There's not enough people here to open enough businesses. So, um, you know, promoting Greenpoint as a uh, Greenpoint Williamsburg Bushwick as a great place to open small shops um, uh, other than alcohol and, and restaurants. Um, you know, you have to spread the word. You have to encourage people to, to open businesses in their in the way that they want and that's i think that really is a pipeline um you know you're telling a landlord that they can't open a a restaurant uh or a bar isn't you know if that's what they think they can make money that's you know there's a certain amount of free will that we should let them have uh and that exists obviously but can we uh can we ask like we just did the one wife and 79 quay ulerps both of them have commitments to work with you guys uh, on retail diversity. They're not hard and fast. If somebody, if they can't find a local jeweler or a local boutique to open, they're gonna have to open something. Um, are there tax incentives that we could look at on the state level? Maybe, I'm not sure how, you know, that's a little bit uh, uh, tricky sometimes, but um, can we ask, uh, like we had, I'm going to bring up a subject, a, a, a sensitive subject, but you know, with River Ring, we asked that they provide job trading money to St. Nick's so that they can serve their population better. Um, that's a minor uh, win, but it's a good win. Um, uh, so there are things like that we can ask of developers and, uh, and small businesses. So it's like you can't, again, instead of targeting like this block has to have such, such, and such try to make the growth happen naturally to people who might want to open another business, but feel that it's uh, a little overwhelming or there's not the right support. Uh, I guess that's why I, yeah, I'll say that for now. Right now I'm trying to figure out where the air train is, but <laughs> <laughs> we get home. Uh, I guess I'm thinking elevator. So that's, yeah, I think that it's, a, it's definitely also a multi level is federal state 
and city government that has to do this. Uh, they all have their role to play. So um, I don't know. I didn't. I can't tell on my phone who else is here. But obviously, um, obviously Lincoln was. I don't know. Or any, no, no state people here. Uh, no, yeah. I believe um, uh, Senator Kavanaugh uh, had an event. They had an event on Brooklyn Nights. Uh, so I'm assuming. Uh, okay. So they didn't respond. I mean, we sent the invitation. Oh, okay. No, no, I'm sure they're busy. It's always hard to make stuff, especially uh, around this time of year. Hopefully, but... hopefully next time. I know, and Ben, it's... you're not going to be in the capacity of the council office, but maybe you'll be as a member of the community. As well, hopefully, I, I, am, I am trying to stay around. So I'll let you, you said know. That. You said I'll that. You know. um, I found the air train, so, but I still can hang on. So. so. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, still space for you. Anything you want to keep saying? Uh, or we um, no, I guess that's, you know, I guess it is that I just want just to reemphasize or say that it is that balance of people want to make money. They want their land, their buildings to make them money. They may want to, it might be their lifelong dream to open a nightlife establishment. That's something, you know, they should be allowed to do, but you have to just find ways to incentivize other things. I mean, we are not a planned society. We're not a planned economy. They tend not to work out too well, though I am far from a capitalist, let me tell you. Uh, but that's where we are. Um, yeah, so. Ben, I, I, I pointed something before. It was uh, the 500 foot uh, law, the, you know, the New York State 500 foot law, you know. Yes, yeah. Definitely uh, was a way uh, to limit the number for whatever reason is there we we don't know but it still exists it's just not been enforced maybe for the reason that you were saying the other were saying the state still make money and that's easy you, you want to cash in but i believe unfortunately we have to look at this deeply and not superficially maybe that's already a tool that already exists we just need our state representative to make sure that when the community asks and when the, the advisory input from the community board comes into the table, it means that there is a reason and that's where the New York State, the New York State Legal Authority should listen and say, hold on, you are triggering, there's already five, it means these other two, three store from left, they will have to be some, something else. Anything, uh, that's an exist, anything that's an existing law, you should definitely work to enforce. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, but I also think, you know, especially just going back to my block, what happened in um, in the pandemic is that there were three buildings were bought. They were affordable housing and there were artists that lived there and they were flipped, you know, and now they're all all those first ground floor apartments are now going to be bars. So it's it's not yeah. it's, it's also about, you know, affordable housing, which, oh, yeah. you know, is, is it seems kind of crazy that that could happen so quickly, but you know the person came in and they that was their goal is they just wanted, you know, bars to be in there because someone who has a bar and can pay what ten thousand dollars, you know, a, a month, you know, that rent stabilized artist who's been living there for fifteen to twenty years, you know, they're gone, you know, and so I think that's the other thing that's happening is New York City, you know, and maybe I'm looking at this through because I have two art degrees also, but it's, you know, it's a city of artists and it's a city of artists as commerce and we are losing that. And to not have, you know, art you and commerce, which can be fashion, which can be music, which can be, you know, there's a, a to be able to curate a space is also through an artistic lens and yes. we're losing that. Um, and, you know, I, it's this is the moment like I, I really feel like the next two years are probably the most important for the, the future of our city no our new york you know, people come to new york because of the arts the fashion you know the nightlife we can't lose any of it and i totally agree i mean again it's a capitalist force that's driving it um so how do what could we obviously regulate capitalism and free markets all the time so how do we regulate it in this case Okay, guy, I see right. that uh, several people at the poll right. and, say, uh, and Steve Chesler at his end raised uh, digitally and now Paul and also Dale. Uh, who wants to go first, guys? Uh, Steve was up first. Okay, Steve Chesler. Then. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, I feel like 
I mean, a lot of good points have made and, um. I mean, as much I feel like it comes to to rent to, you know, like to commercial rent. And city tax policy, state tax policy. So it just seems like landlords are, you know, incentivized to, you know, they have to, you know, not only, you know, cover their costs, but they want to go beyond, you know, to have the largest return on their investment. Then they're going to for it, they go for the liquor and the, and the food. Um, but I think going back to like, what can our board do? I feel like a couple people have touched on. I feel like we need we need data from the district. And I know for, I think the land use committee, when we had a you know text amendment related to hotel special permits, I believe we hired um, somebody. I don't know if we hired someone, but tasked a I think a graduate student or a graduate program to study um, hotels in the district. And I just wonder if the board should, you know, maybe embark on something similar. To survey the neighborhood, just you know, just not just take the word of like ten board members, but really go out there and find out what the need is and how the predominance of and growing predominance of 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 bars is having you know is having a negative impact on the neighborhood and, and block by, by block by block. And as Julia touched on, just lack of access to um, essentials. You know, it's just harder and harder to come in contact with those. And then maybe the end, end of that is how can, um, you know, uh, property owners be incentivized to rent their spaces to, you know, a diverse group of businesses. And one thing that popped to mind is the, you know, the, the incentivized zone where 25 Kent and a um, number of other, others where, you know, they get a, they get a density bonus if they include a light manufacturing business in the floor that maybe you know, property owners say like on a Lorimer or Manhattan Avenue, they're giving you know an option with their zoning where if they include a certain use group of businesses, then they they can get that you know twenty percent increase in density or something like that. Um, you know, tool, tools like that. But I feel like for I feel in terms of the community board, I feel like if we're going to pat, you know we're going towards some sort of resolution, you know, the board to make a statement. I feel like we need the, we need the community behind us to do that. Rather than just, you know, you know, we obviously have some people here directly from the ground who own businesses or own homes in the, in the neighborhood or rent in the, you know, um, but um, I mean, I, I, I mean, in, in the vacuum, I agree with Ben. Yeah, we're, we're in a free market society, but I feel like we can put, um, you know, if things are having a negative impact, you know, whether you know, something's physically toxic or emotionally or mentally toxic, you know, just. Um, as Francois talked about, just you know, the the DUI count is up off the charts, uh, affecting so many different things. And I think rules can be put in place, but then again, on the other side of it, the economics incentivizing um, landlords to rent to businesses other than bars and restaurants. I'll just I'll just add that Steve to your point that there is a model with the Fresh program. Where in in certain low income areas, you uh, an owner would get a bonus even in a residential building to put in Julia to your point a grocery store that hits certain parameters. So I think that it's a, you make a lot of really good points, and you know I'll leave it to Sante to think about what you know how we sort of formalize this conversation. And it's not about solving things today, but really getting the group together, people that are passionate about resolving this and figuring out how to get buying from the community, but. But so much of what you just you basically described, there there are other systems that have been put in place to try to incentivize the right kind of uses just for that diversity. So very good point. Thank you. Well, there is Paul and Dale. They both want to say. I let you uh, maybe Dale, Paul. I know what um, either of you, whatever one. Oh, go ahead, Dale. Okay, thanks. Um, I do have a, another commitment. I did mention that when. Um, you know, I responded to your invitation, so thank you for inviting me. I I, I think I have a, a thought that with respect to what everybody said, but in particular Ben and also Steve. Um, ben said he's far from a capitalist. Personally, I am a capitalist, and I have, but I have said for years that I don't think that we really have a true free market anymore. I think that we we messed with the concept of a free market long ago in many things, but in particular when we started, when the city started allowing uh, 
um, out developers to have the sense that they could easily pay speculative prices for for uh, properties, get you know, understanding or expecting that they're going to get all these variances to build you know the the affordable housing. And then they put the little bit of, I mean, to build the, the market rate housing, and they put the little bit of, of affordable in uh, uh, as, as um, a, uh, a, a carrot. And it's not really affordable. We know that it's not affordable to the people who have been in this community. It's nonsense. So they pay, the, they, they, they pay these incredibly high prices. Um, and then, they're, of course, they turn around and they're going to charge these enormous rents. So I, I, you know, clearly diversity in our retail and our commercial spaces is what any good um, town or city should be able to plan for. My sense is there's been very little planning. There's been it's just been it's been spoken about. You know, we make we 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 talk about oh yes we have city planning city planning. And yet, whenever the land use committee or the community board wants the city to deny or condition um, these, these variances and these zoning changes uh, by saying, no, you have to have more affordable housing, you have to have true affordable housing, you shouldn't have such a high building that's completely out of context. So where does that go? It goes nowhere. Um, and so now we're talking about um, what do we do to incentivize developers for, to to uh, rent spaces to um, to retailers who can't afford to pay the kind of rents that bars and and restaurants can pay? And so, what do we do there? Do we give the developers even more tax breaks, more incentives, make it easier for them to continue to um, to to charge these high rents? I don't know. Have we gotten to the point where that's that's all we can do? Again, I think we have totally mucked with the concept of of a free market. Free market would have been let them come and pay the you know the the value of of, of the land without assuming they're going to get all these these uh, variances, and you know that would have been free market. Someone said to me one time, some couple of years ago, you know. Before all of this started to happen with giving the developers all these variances and with the rezoning, we didn't need affordable housing. We had affordable housing. So um, I don't have the answer. I think that Steve, you're right. I think we're you know let's we can we can do as we can do all of the the surveys that we want that that are that can be possibly done to find out what kinds of businesses people in the community could would like but how are we going to then get develop, get the, the owners to charge rents that these kinds of businesses could afford I think I think we I think it would be very easy to sit down you can you can start right now people would like shoemakers they'd like clothing stores they you know you can just go down a whole list of things that I think you know all of the, the things that Julia was talking about. I was here when we could we could see those kinds of shops and and do that kind of shopping. It was amazing. Greenpoint was amazing when I first moved here 40 years ago. But they all started. They had to close because they couldn't afford the rent. So I don't know. I I wish I had the answer. I I have been fighting for years, um, and I continued to fight recently to try to. Get the city not to uh, just continue to just allow the, the developers to come in and and uh, reap the benefits of paying their speculative prices. And now here we are, guys. Here we are. This is where we are. We're going to get restaurants and bars unless unless what? I don't know. I really don't have the answer. But I think it's um, I don't think it was a foregone conclusion. I don't think it had to happen. Um, I've fought against it personally, against my own best interests. All these new market rate developments just make my property value go up and up and up. And against my own self-interest, I've begged people, don't do it. 
do that. Don't give up on manufacturing space. Don't do that. I don't know. I feel like I don't know anymore what to do. And I think it's, um, I think, you know, people who have who've, uh, been developers and, and who have continued to push to let these developers continue to um, have these kinds of situations where they're just going to pay these outrageous, crazy prices, and then what do, you, what do we think they're going to do? They're going to charge incredible rents. And then what? So then we'll give them tax breaks and give them more incentives. They'll continue to charge the rents, and then the city and taxpayers will um, will will pay to uh, have the have have the uh, developers charge lower rents. I don't know. So I'm gonna I'm gonna respond. I think you're painting a very one-dimensional picture that I vehemently disagree with. Um, I'll, I'll tell you for, for one, for one that I bought, I'm, I'm, I'll try, I'd like to respond. Um, I, th I think the issue right now of the lack of retail diversity in the moment is because bars and restaurants are being given a 25 to 30% premium that has nothing to do with an owner. It has everything to do with government policy and some people who decided that restaurants are more deserving than any other type of business. And it's a pure game of math. What's going on right now? I think it's very good news that, as Ben pointed out, that that wasn't voted on. Um, I disagree with what you're saying about industri industry. I bought my site at the Williamsburg Hotel from a scrap metal yard, a 90-year-old owner who was retiring who had six employees making minimum wage. I employ between 100 to 130 people, very many of them living in the community. We've taken housekeepers and put them on a career track where they're now salaried workers. So it's a very, very simplistic analysis that you just put forth that I disagree with. Um, and I don't agree with you in terms of the survey. I think Julia made a great point. There's, for example, one example, there's a shoemaker on the corner of North 10th and Berry, who's been there for a while, who is in the building of a, of a real estate developer. And I think it would be very interesting to go and talk to him and understand how does he maintain his business? I'm a customer of his. He has a very, it's, a, it's not a huge store. Um, and I think what your, your, your approach, Dell, is doing everyone here a disservice, both on the call and in the community, because to Ben's point, there are things you cannot change, and that's the force of economic evolution, and things you can change. And making sure that there's a unified effort and policies that allow small business to have, at, at a minimum, an even playing field. And today, there is no even playing field, because if you're a restaurant, you're basically getting a 30%, 25 or 30% premium, and your net effective rent is less. And that was a bill that was almost passed and made permanent. Um, but throwing, accusing developers of willy nilly this and that, you know, I don't know when you moved into this day, but my grandfather's been here since the 1970s. So we can go down a path and talk about who came first. The Polish community was here first, then the Hispanic community. You know, my grandfather was a tenant on the waterfront on, on, on the corner of North 10th and Kent and was thrown out from his space that he didn't own because they were, they were planning in 1980 a rezoning. So, this is about Sante's point. It's a complex set of factors. Um, what's happening right now in the moment is if there isn't a thoughtful conversation about outdoor space that only benefits restaurants, everyone's going to suffer. And this has nothing to do and is not the responsibility of developers. This issue is a citywide issue. And members of the city council that I think put this forth without really, not that nothing, no one had bad intentions. Everyone has great intentions. They want to help the restaurants in their community and the entrepreneurs in their community, but it has dramatic impact. And I think to Julia's point, there are gems of stores that are alive and succeeding and whether it's because as Paul mentioned, they have an online presence or it's a shoemaker that managed to do, a, you know, 10 things. He's, you know, I, I've gone to him to fix a belt. Um, he's doing, you know, he obviously has figured out a business model that works in pretty expensive real estate on North 10th and Berry next door to a restaurant to really understand the reality of the, the stores that are succeeding and how to make sure that others have that opportunity. And I think blindly just putting forth an anti-development view is not helpful to this conversation. That's my, my thought. Before I well, ask the sorry, word for... I'm sorry you think I'm uh, you know, a detriment to the community, but that is my opinion. And um, we can well, agree to disagree. Before I pass the word to Paul, I'd love to tap in both what you uh, and Toby uh, were saying. 
we were pointing Greenpoint, and for example, it's even not to do with the developer, and I'm in the land use committee. I believe one of our latest recommendation on Quake Street development, or at least I believe it was my input, Dell, and you receive it, you transcribe it there as a recommendation, was about retail diversity. And I believe we put parameter, and so, you know, uh, you know, I have to say, I'm against certain large-scale development, but uh, it's also true, you know, certain development, if they actually bring a, a, an, an entity that produce Android employee, you know, maybe I want to glorify that maybe that has a positive impact, that definitely we can put the parameters in place, we can have a framework where we say, hey, Retail diversity. Somebody questioned me at community board, right? What do you mean for retail diversity? I thought it was logic to say retail diversity. What do they mean? If you open 10 storefront, and that's why I always ask Dale, what's the scale of the retail space, right? Because if you do like 10,000 square feet, we know it's going to be something big, maybe a pharmacy once again, and we don't need it. We have too many CVS, Twain, Reed, and who knows how many. So I believe putting a framework. Uh, uh, from our side, that's already enough. But going back to Greenpoint, for example, we have another dynamic, uh, uh, this two-story, three-story building, which they've been acquired by, I don't know if they can be called developer, some investor, they buy the building, they turn it over very fast, and their focus is like maximize $10,000, $12,000 rent. Francois mentioned the same building, historic building, you know, uh, brick building, uh, they, uh, they were maybe the ground floor was residential, has been reconverted to what historically was commercial storefront, but no, with a different uh, ambition, the 10, 12, $15,000 a month rent. So he's even not a developer. It's a developer by his spot renovation of, of this small scale building. And that's, I believe, is some of the fabric in our neighbor is really, really threatened because we have a chance probably to put input from our land use committee, how are we going to use those space? So and by the way, I want, I want to just... It, it, oh, it, Paul, Dale, I really I, that Paul so, so I want to just add one thing, just Dell. This was, uh, we, the purpose of this joint committee is for dialogue and disagreement. And I have tremendous respect for everything that you do to protect the community. I think to Sante's point, you know, there, there are developers that have done really bad things. You know, the history of what's going on in Bushwick with some of the you know, the stabilized units and people really doing horrific things to get rid of tenants. All, all I ask is that we not point to any specific category of, you know, nothing is the fault only of elected officials or only of developers or only of, of members of, of bars. You know, we fully intend, we actually reached out to Babar. We fully intend to bring them into this conversation. It's about bringing people together that have different perspectives and trying to come up with a practical way to have our voice heard when, Ours is only a suggestion, and it has nothing. You know, you've done amazing work, and I say the hardest jobs in the community board are land use, and and the liquor committee. Those are very very practical. There's a lot of pressure, and so kudos to you, Dell, for everything you've done. And you know, the goal really is not that we all have to agree. If we all agree, there's no creativity, but that we need to dialogue with each other and try to come up with solutions to to what's a very very challenging problem that. If we don't even try, nothing's going to change. So let me just answer that. I agree. I think that it is. I have no problem with people disagreeing with me and with myself disagreeing. I think it's very important for people to be able to talk to each other. I also think it's not very productive to tell to to tell, to to say things to each other like you're a detriment to this community or you're a detriment to this group because. <laughs> So, because I have a, because I disagree, maybe I disagree with everybody who's here tonight, but it's an opinion and I have no problem with people saying, well, they don't agree with me and they think it's completely wrong and then, they, and then why? I mean, I personally, I think it's a shame when people can't listen to, to other opinions. I think that that just shuts everything down. Um, and, and Again, I didn't just focus on just developers either, um, but I think that what has happened is you get these variances where we've been enticed to get all of these, 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 these you know, I have nothing against market rate housing either, 
But let's face it, in my opinion anyway, we when we did the rezoning and we made it so that it, it so developers really took it for granted that they would get all of these variances that were their variances. This is not what they were they supposed to be buying their the land uh, on. Um, we mucked up. We, uh, it's my opinion, we 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 messed with the free market, and so now we're we're um in that situation, you know. Um, so where do we go? I don't know. I think that there may be solutions if we can get the city to work with us. And yes, Sante, we have been trying to get developers to give some kind of commitment to making spaces at least at least some smaller spaces that would pretty much, you know, con confine the use to not a bar and not a restaurant. Um, it, it, it may be a start. I don't know. I want to pass the word to Paul. Sorry, Dale. He's been waiting for a while and I want yeah, to take I advantage of his presence here. Paul Sorry, Paul. No, no problem. I just want to say very quickly, and I, I don't want to speak about policy or variances or anything like that. I want to be much more basic. Um, if I'm thinking about my lifelong ambition, I'm going to open a shop somewhere, whether it's, you know, has to do with, uh, it's a gallery or, or a shoe store or, or whatever it is. You know, the first thing I do is I make sure I've got finances in order to be able to do it because I don't want to be out on my ass in a, in a week or two. Uh, the second thing I do is I look for a location where I think it's going to work. And, and to me, that has a lot to do with, you know, what we're currently going through right now. And I feel, and I mentioned perception earlier on and when I spoke, I feel that, you know, we need to sell our communities somehow. I think we, we're we losing that idea that people looking from the outside, and it's not always just looking from the inside at ourselves, but looking from the outside. You know, if I want to move in, if I want to take a shot and I open, or I want to open my shop in Bushwick or Greenpoint or Williamsburg, I want to know that I chose that neighborhood, that community, because I think my product is going to be accepted there because I think I'm going to have an audience. I think I'm this, I've, I've researched places and I don't want to go to Austin and I don't want to go to Portland and I don't want to go. I want to go to Brooklyn and I want to go here. And so I, I think that, you know, it, the important thing is we can have the space, even if we work out getting the space, but we have to create the interest. We have to, we have to create a uh, recreate, uh, the, you know, an ability to, to, to be able to offer the interest so that people look at our neighborhoods and go, yes, that's where I want to open my business. And I, I don't have solutions. I don't, you know, don't even have suggestions. So thank me for that. If you want, I have nothing, but, um, I just think on a more basic level, we, you know, whether it's, whether it, you know, I'm thinking of things that we can do that, you know, without having to go to the city and whatever. I mean, do we need to promote our communities? Do we need to figure out a way of saying, this is where you want your business to be? This is, this is where it was. This is what it can be. And you should be part of it. You know, I, it's just, it's all, as everyone was saying, Ben and, and Lincoln and everybody, nothing's going to happen overnight. But we have to think in a lot of different directions. The, the solution isn't going to come just from one specific focus in one direction. We have to think in a lot of different directions. And for me, one of the most basic things is if I'm going to take a shot at opening a small business, I want to make sure that it's exactly where I want it to be because I chose it because I love that location and I love that neighborhood and I love those people and I think the market is perfect for me. And that's about creating um i guess it's it's not really creating a brand again I, we everybody throws that word around too much the brooklyn brand whatever but it's just about creating interest in the community we need people to say I, that's where i want my business to be and then those businesses will be we can't say we need them yet we got to find people that want to come as well it's not just all coming from one direction so I, I, you know, that I was just, I just wanted to kind of blurt that out because I think, you know, our focus goes pretty much in one direction and there's a lot of people or a lot of elected officials or a lot of state officials or whatever to blame. But I think there's things that we should be able to do as well, which kind of elevates, you know, our communities from a small business standpoint. 
And then I just have to say also that I do need to jump. I thank you on behalf of myself and the North Brooklyn Chamber, and I'll speak for Elaine, whose name I still see there. I mean, thanks for asking us to contribute. Um, realize that she and I love nothing more than sitting in a room with creative, passionate, and, and intelligent individuals. So we're always available. So, I mean, reach out to us. We, you know, love to continue the dialogue, love to help out any way we can. Uh, we're around. So, you know, again, uh, uh, thank you. Um, and if you continue this, please continue to let us know and we'll participate in the dialogue as it goes forward. But yeah, that's, hey, there she is. Hi, Elaine. Oh, hi, Elaine. Good to see you. I've been here the whole time. Um, I really have enjoyed this conversation. I think this is the way that we're going to get the interest back in our community. I think part of what happened was um, we didn't have this problem before COVID and COVID, you know, brought this. Um, it, it's just unbelievable to me what has happened uh, during this time. We're not out of it yet. Um, as Paul said, we're, we're here. We welcome these kind of conversations. We may not have all the answers, but we will try, you know, whatever we can to make a connection to get somebody some help. Um, you know, the other thing I would like to go back to what, um, Francoise was talking about. I used to go, uh, take a yoga class, like at 9 at night at 10 at night and walk home and, and feel safe. And you can't do that anymore, you know, and I'm not sure if that's because there are not so many police around. Um, I was never worried walking around late at night and now you can't do this. Uh, Francoise has come to us several times and talked to us about the lack of security and the lack of police presence. Uh, people are talking about garbage. You know, there's a whole lot of issues that are that are going on and. Um, uh, as Paul and, and everybody said, we don't have the answers, but we're glad to be part of the conversation and try and come up with some solutions. And um, as Paul said, we have to jump on uh, another call soon. So I thank you all for all your input. Be well. Thank you, Elaine and Paul. Thank you, thank you for thank joining you us. Thank you very much. Sure. Our pleasure. Bye-bye. Uh, yeah. Certainly it's going to be an ongoing conversation and that's the, you know, Keep us in the loop, please. We will. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, Paul. See you, back. Hey, um, Santi, this is Forster. Um, Paul made some good points. But yes, we are in a pandemic, and this started long before the pandemic. Um, I wanted to ask Marie, how long or how many times does it take for a survey to happen to a community? I strongly still believe we need to survey the community to find out what is needed in the community. I personally see that there are not a lot of black owned industries in this community. One thing is for hair and they don't succeed because the rent goes up. The rent goes up. I'm gonna give an example. Carol Bridal Shop has been closed for over five years. I used to go in there and get all my little things because I do, you know, little things, make little things, you know, um, with my hot glue gun and people maybe not be getting married like they used to have the big weddings and so on. But that place has been closed for over five years. Why? People cannot afford the rent. And that's what Paul was stating to make sure you have your finances also. Location, location, location is good too. But if the landlord wants to keep Jack and rent up, I'm going to give an example of what I'm saying is a young lady came to the SLA for her restaurant for us to recommend, thank you, Marie, for reminding me to state that word, a liquor license, but she had so many problems with her application and we were like, we cannot recommend you. And she was so frustrated with us. And someone blatantly asked her, why do you need to sell alcohol? How else am I going to make money? And that was her answer. And I thought about that. Man, we have a lot of folks that drink a lot in this neighborhood too. Um, folks are not shopping the way they used to, but 
there are people my age that still want to shop in the neighborhood. Like I said, I don't drink, period. The new year's coming. I'm going to have some cider. Anybody want to join me? Fine. But we still, Marie, how long or how many years is it before they do a survey of the neighborhood? I, that, that's a question I, you know, want to ask. The question is, who are they? So, so I mean, there may be, there may be a surveys done by city planning. There may be uh, surveys done by the Census Bureau when they, they come out with a 10 year census. And it also okay. come out with American Community um, Survey, which we could do we, certain things with business. Can we elicit our own survey from the board? Yeah, but the question is how do you structure that up? And if you already have entities in the neighborhood that may have done this or have those resources, um, like uh, Evergreen, and I'm sure that I'm, I'm, I don't know if the people are still here from the business community. I think they're gone. No, I think they left. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that you have, we have to look at what's out there before you even say you want to do a but, survey. Okay. When I was on, uh, if I could say, when I was on uh, intern oh, with bye. Gail, when I yeah, sorry, just when I interned with Gail. Thank you, Brewer, Marie. About yeah, thank you. About 10, 12 years ago. Uh, I spent about, me and another intern for spent about a month walking the southern half of her district block by block, writing down what type of business was on each block. Not a very efficient, maybe, but we got the job done. Another team did the north half. So, uh, I mean, your... <laughs> Ben, I mean, the North Brooklyn small business owners, we did do that for Franklin Street. Um, yeah, just, I, mean, you know, takes... I mean, it was, it, it was pretty. You just literally walk down the street and take notes. Yeah. Um, and then a group of us kind of did it for green planners. So I can circle back to Julia and, and kind of see what happened with that, because that was, I think, most of Greenpoint and Williamsburg. Um, but then you got to you got to deal with the data. You got to make sure the data is. Oh, you know. it's an it was an insane Excel document, because then we also uploaded photographs of each storefront um oh, well, to that's, the document. yeah that's yeah that's, it was uh it was a pivot table um but, but i do think but is that something that could be done through uh participatory participatory budgeting like could we ask oh, for you know if the chamber and the small business owners came together and just said you know we want to do a small business survey of um our neighborhood uh, if you have a, if you have a, a district doing expense funding, yes, it would, have to, it would have to be through expense funding through PB. You could always just ask, you could always put in a request. I mean, I, I don't think the chamber is a nonprofit, but you can do it with, uh, Evergreen's only the IBC. So I'm not sure what, non, maybe, maybe St. Nick's, I don't know. You might want to find a nonprofit, but, uh, you know, or you just ask the council member for expense funding to do it as long as there's a, a nonprofit they can. And what's it? But also, Francois, sure to, tap, to tap on what uh, Steve was saying, and one of the idea uh, of having this conversation tonight, and this has been done in Europe, in in a more other Scandinavian country, uh, is community divisions. And one of the big issue, I believe, in the history, because even the city council had all these like uh, beautiful points that were made and recommendation. And things were passed to other city agency, or which I don't know, they have lost the stamina along the way to do exactly that type of research uh, and maybe tap in the community. Sometimes, you know, the agency don't do the survey, maybe the way the community really would want to know, because we have a meter, you know, maybe here in Greenpoint, but there is other portion and other people in, in, our, in, in our district, in portion of the community we're not fully aware. And it's community division. You know, we need to shave it. We can build probably a, a, a way we could provide and create this input. You mentioned, yes, we can welcome Franklin. You did welcome Franklin. But we are very aware of what is happening in our community, for example. You know, we should be in communication through the community board, through the other community organization, or even through, you know, in Greenpoint, our Greenpoint coalition, which is tapping to many individuals and is very uncontaminated. It's purely about quality of life and how we like to live and, and the changes we've been observing and we have continue to observe every day. And so I don't know how exactly, but I believe uh, uh, we need to have a more active role in whatever type of survey is done if one 
today or in the you know upcoming future the city will really move uh, more effectively in this regard Elisa? can i ask julia a question julia with the survey are you talking about a survey just to see what businesses are here or are you talking about a survey to reach out to the community to to get a sense of what kinds of things the community would want well maybe you mean both i don't know it could be both but it was basically to find out what the community would want right that's what i thought and i think that's a great idea because on the so. land use committee when we talk to the, the developers and we say we want you to try to we want you to give us a commitment that's not really it, it doesn't really bind them but at least you know we have begun an effort and when we say to the the developers we'd like you to make a commitment that you will give um more diversity to the commercial space you're going to rent it would be great to have a sense that well in this area people really want these things but in that area over there this is what the people want and then we could maybe then if we had that kind of information we could get the backing of the, of this of our electeds to to you know include that in their uh requirements lisa yeah, hi, I'm building on what Dell is saying and uh, also um, Julia, the mechanism to get that is that I, I agree with you, Dell. I think, I think it's area by area, but inclusive of whole areas. And is it something that we, we ask city council rep to help us in terms of maybe having town hall meetings and then we go to the block associations and we you know it's going to be a patchwork it's not going to be the same for every single block and every single you know demographic and therefore we we get more of a patchwork um and more diversity yeah i i, I don't know um but i think it's worth uh, um investigating um and maybe even asking the uh, elected who, you know, well, not only the elected officials, the community leaders, like I live here in Cooper Park yeah. houses, you got tenant associations, you got block associations, sure, sure, sure. you know, not just the stores, you know, sure. like I said, it's the community, see yeah. what the people in the community want. Yeah. And speaking from the people that live in Cooper, I do know they want more retail because I hear it all the time. Although I am no longer their president, but I still hear it. We don't have anywhere to shop over here anymore. I go, no, we don't. Well, we got a whole lot of places to hang out. Hey, yeah, you do. But yeah, exactly. You know, yes, so I agree. Just saying, you can go to the leaders, and yeah. I'll, definitely our council people. We got new council people coming in. We need to speak to them. You know, um, things didn't change overnight, and we know this is not going to change overnight. But it's a it's a step. And it seems like it's going to be a good step. That sounds I, very good. I agree. <laughs> I agree. And I agree, Julia, with you that this did not really, I don't think we can blame the, the pandemic for all of this. I, I agree this started before the pandemic. Um, Definitely had. Uh, absolutely, Dale. I mean, uh, the city council document already was indicating that I believe with the pandemic has been, the issue has been, uh, you know, some events have become predatory. We mentioned the word before, you know, and uh, intentionally or unintentionally, you know, uh, certain industry, they're taking advantage. That's normal, right? In business, we, uh, we, we become opportunistic. That's fair enough. That's, I'm a capitalist too, right? So there is opportunism. But I believe one of the responsibility uh, from our uh, system, from our politics, is that to measure because you know, uh, you know, things become uh, criminal, and they take away democracy too. Because uh, you know, I lose the freedom to uh, be an independent uh, businessman. Then, uh, if I don't have, uh, you know, if I don't want to run a bar <laughs> or a restaurant or another business or an industry, this happened before. Am I might confine that? Uh, that's it. What am I going to do? Do I have to be dependent from something else? So, if I don't have an higher level of education. I mentioned that before, it's very important. Uh, the, the local retail business give opportunity also to people as less uh, uh, higher education. But, you know, maybe very simply, it doesn't need to open a restaurant, which may even require 
or a bar today an higher level of sophistication because it's an entertainment business. It's about eat, drink, and play. And, and, and so even there, it's not that easily achievable. And, and I see here, there is a local maybe food, the pap and mom business, you know, brick and mortar one. They have very di big difficulty because they can't afford to be a bar and restaurant. So that's what I'm saying, it's an industry. But again, uh, we're not accusing the industry. Uh, we want to really find a way. I, I'm very happy that uh, really you all attended, that we have the North Brooklyn Chamber with uh, Paul and Elaine and uh, Lincoln Wrestler. I believe uh, uh, we have to become uh, a, a cost and presence. And I believe that maybe I was new. I haven't been in the community board. You have been uh, there for a very long time. Steve has been here uh, longer, but definitely not as long as you and Julia and other have been in the community board, maybe we have lost focus. And even the SLA review committee, and again, it's not just the, the, the issue of the economic development, they have been working together. Maybe Toby has mentioned that to me last time, so maybe the, we had to work together. Several committee have to work together if we want to rebuild this fabric socially, economically, you know, uh, architecturally, whatever, it, 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 we have isolated. And, and when, you know, we've been divided, I'm assuming in this vision, even the community has been divided. And even uh, a grassroots organization where more, this is my observation. And again, I'm an immigrant and somebody didn't even know how this worked, but what I have understood, the even grassroots organization were truly the representation of the community. They have become organization by itself with people with salary. And definitely, even there, you become a business. You know, you, you seek the grants, you seek the salary, you know, but we have to go back. And this was the idea of the outreach committee. And we don't have tools as outreach committee because the community board has very limited resources, as we know. So we can make all these list of things, but they go back to Marie or to Jerry and work with that capability. I believe that talking, and there is no time even a community board now with the time restriction. So maybe the platform of the outreach committee together with the economic development committee, that's where we talk and that's where community can come and talk about this. I mean, maybe that's the outreach we do and the more people know, the more people will come. I believe we made some step forward just, uh, and so really I thank you anybody who was here tonight. But again, Toby, do you want to say something else? Because uh, you're the chair of the economic development, and I... I... I have to sign off. I'm on the train now, so it's been... I'm going to head out. Uh, but thank you so much. I'll see you okay. around. Okay, Ben, thank you. Thanks. Have nice I have to back. sign off, too, now. I had this other commitment that I'm out late to, but thank you for inviting me and for listening to me. Okay. All right, see you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Dad. Oh. Toby, before we run a motion. I think Toby, Toby dropped off. No, Toby is there, but probably she's driving. Oh, she got. She's gone. She oh, got no, she's, there. She's, there. she's still here. She's still there. I think she's driving. Toby, are you there? I believe we're gonna probably, uh, I'm gonna wait for her to be connected. Maybe we should um, make, I will make soon a motion to adjourn. At least uh, you don't wanna keep talking and say other things. Elisa, Steve, uh, Francois, anybody? Say one thing that, I mean, we probably could obtain um, a very simple questionnaire that we put out to the various groups. So we could start building that along with everything else. Um, and simpler is better. So, um, but I agree with you, Sante, that this is the forum to keep this discussion going and it's long overdue. Well, I guess that's, I, I have a question about that. I mean, this has been a really great discussion, really important discussion, but it seems like it's, a, it's an economic development discussion. I'm trying to figure out why it's an outreach committee discussion. Um, Cause I feel like we've talked very little about communication and outreach and the board. It's just more about you know, uh, a specific issue that's very important to people who are in this meeting and how the board can work to work towards that. But I don't understand why it's an outreach committee issue. 
I think, I mean, just for me, seeing it is, is a place for someone to come to be able to articulate their concerns, then to formalize it back to economic development. So I, again, I think we're trying to put these pieces back together. Um, and I think a lot of good ideas came out of this that, you know, we could put back in the right committees. And I believe this was always an idea, you know, to take advantage of our rich committee as a first outreach itself, just having a platform where to talk about this outreach. And we have other, we don't, look, the reality is that we, we can envision everybody doing something else or doing this other to reach by already talking and having these people talking for the community. This was already the first operation of outreach, I'm assuming. And I, I wish we could, this could become something bigger and we even have voted for things that probably me or you and the people that we always hear uh, want to volunteer and even go uh, in public places and, and talk and outreach more about topics. And, but this is a, one of the very important topics that has to do with the livability of a neighborhood, sustainability of a neighborhood. You know, I believe it is, it seems, so we went to the legal license, but it's just because there hasn't been any form of policy and went over there, but it's really not about that. It's about uh, rent, uh, affordable possibility for other, I mean, it's, it's about being a neighbor, you know, and, uh, and, you know, impact on parks or now that could impact parks. <laughs> I mean, there's so many layers. I mean, but, and Toby want to, yeah, we've been, you know, communicating on this and trying to unify these desire and these forces. Did I answer? Uh, sort of. <laughs> um, but yeah, I understand what you're saying. I have to go, guys. So I'm going to say good night. Toby, I, Toby, are you there? She popped in and popped out. I mean, I don't know what's going on with her video. Maybe because she's driving. She appears there from a phone, but not. Yeah, yeah her, her mic is off, so I can't even speak to her. Her mic is off? Yes, she's got it off. I mean, she can't talk, but she could hear, she didn't listen. Toby. Toby. She tried. She <laughs> okay, guys, so then, uh, you know, she's probably has a connection problem. Uh, maybe I'll call it. You all have to go. It's eight o'clock. Uh, she's up. She's probably competing now. I'm sorry, Santi. I called for a motion for Toby. I I was gonna call for a motion for again. No, no, I apologize. My phone froze. I'm back. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, I'm listening. Uh, do you want to say something to close? I'm gonna. No, call that's for fine. I just wanted to commend you again and uh, express appreciation to everyone who participated. We look forward to having consistent meetings and really trying to drive action. And anyone who's willing to meet in person, Santi and I have been meeting every other week. So we would love love to do this in person, you know, outside of the construct of the formal meeting to help move this forward. Go ahead, Sante. That's all. Motion to adjourn. So, hold on a minute. Toby, I sent you a message. Could you um, give me a telephone call? If not tonight, tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Did, did you, do you have my cell phone number? No, I don't. I was sending you mine. Yeah, let me, let me get... Uh, I'll get it from Marie because we're like... Oh, yeah, yeah. Day. No problem. No problem. And thank you okay. all. And Francois, I really appreciate your insight and everyone who's taking the time to join us. I think we're... The goal is we started a process. We really need to continue to move this forward. And okay, thank you, Francois. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Joe. Maureen. Bye. Good night, everyone. Merry Christmas. Okay. So, same to you. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Maureen.